When I first came, I asked the community how many of these reserves are around here, and they told me four or five. And so I went to the last reserve that they knew of, and I asked again. And this sort of took place over the course of a month and a half, two months, where I just kept going to the last one that they knew about, and we go to the next one, um, and ended up finding, you know, 52 of these places. They always extend across the width of the stream. In most instances, they're quite close to a community. Uh, in most instances, the length of the reserve is determined by um, how far uh, the village spreads. It is fascinating to watch these fish, and I've spent a lot of time watching these fish. You know, if you walk out of the zone and you cast a shadow across the school of fish that are lingering near the, the boundary, they inevitably will go back into the reserve. Even if there's like deeper water and better place to hide just a little further out, they'll swim across shallow water to get to a deep pool inside the reserve. There are some visual cues that fish must be aware of, um, but other than, other than a, you know the occasional flag depicting where the end of the boundary is, there's nothing that that would be per perceptible to the fish. So, yeah, it's still a big mystery how they know. All of the mossier species, the large catfish, um, the hypsobarbus, these large tinfoil barbs, uh, they all do phenomenally much better inside the reserve. If we think about the seasonality of systems like this one, where you have fish that are migrating up uh, prior to the rainy season, they're getting ready to spawn, and they're just sort of hanging out, waiting for the waters to rise, um, putting on putting on weight before they they reproduce, and so they're highly vulnerable when the water is really low prior to the rainy season. Um, and so having a place where even though you can see the fish, you can't harvest those fish is going to create a spot that maintains some proportion of that population. These reserves act as maybe a, a reprieve uh, during the height of fishing potential, the height of the, the potential loss of fish um, when waters are low and when they're, they're at their most vulnerable. Generally, in freshwater areas, there hasn't been a whole lot of emphasis placed on spatial protection, the same way that we've thought about putting in, you know, uh, national parks on a terrestrial landscape or these marine protected areas. Uh, because we often just assume that if we protect the forest around a river, then that river is receiving the benefit. But rivers flow through those landscapes and, and things change along the way and, and connectivity becomes really important. And rivers move across areas that extend far beyond the terrestrial boundaries. What's striking about the system is that these communities have decided to do this all on their own. They've decided to do it independently. Uh, there's no government instruction that this has to be done. Any program that's looking to really have long-term conservation success, you have to have the local communities take ownership of, of that action. And so here it's, you know, it was instituted by communities and it's grown organically from, from the communities up. But I think it, where you have projects that are trying to do do fish conservation and where over harvest is the biggest effect. I think giving, using a spatial model and, and working with communities to delineate the area where they're going to monitor, they're going to protect it, and you, you know, suggest to them that, you know, this is sort of like you're setting up a bank account of fish here. This is your bank account and you guys can harvest all of the interest on that bank account, but the longer that you guys keep this, this area of fish in, in uh, healthy, 
the, the more you're going to benefit as a community in the long term. And that, you know, that sort of formalizes this, this sense of ownership.